good evening. My name is Dale Robinson, and I want to welcome you to my podcast, Observer of Anomalous Objects. Um, really excited about today's podcast. We have some tremendous guests. I'm going to go ahead and bring my co-host uh, up real quick. And this is Rob Heatherly. And uh, some of you will recognize Rob not only from being on my podcast, but Rob, you've kind of been active uh, doing some other things, haven't you? Now, Rob might have a little bit yeah, of a um, delay. Uh, get the military witnesses to UAP channel. My uh, best friend, uh, Shannon. Well, the other thing that, yeah, that I think we'll probably remember you is you um, were on Matt Ford's like show. To yeah, we got a little bit of a delay for all the evidence. We're doing. They're they're trying. To... We're having a little bit of lagging with you there. I'm going to go ahead and bring the other guest up. I'm going to bring Darcy on right now. So excited to have um, filmmaker director Darcy Weir with us right now. Um, so excited to have you. And then of course we have one other gentleman who's going to be here. Your good buddy, Andy. Is it Marcial? Is that how you pronounce your last name? All right. I think you guys' mics are muted. I'm unmuted. Oh, okay, I'm there good. you go. So, yeah. You unmuted. pronounced it. They, they were <laughs> muted when I was looking at them. Um, anyway, so excited. Uh, New York UAP discussion as well. Um, I got a. I have a video clip I want to go ahead and uh, play real quick um, of your movie so everybody knows exactly what we're going to be talking about. Darcy Weir is an independent researcher and filmmaker who has traveled around the world to study the UFO phenomenon. Back in August of 2020, under a shroud of secrecy, the UAP task force was clandestinely brought into existence within the shadows of the enigmatic U.S. Department of Defense. My questions regarding this phenomenon led me to American oceanographer and retired Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet. How long did you serve for the Navy and work for NOAA? I served in the Navy for 32 years, and I then worked for NOAA after that for about three and a half years. They're coming from somewhere. Uh, we don't know how they're doing what they're doing, and we don't know their intentions. So uh, all I can say is there, this deserves a significant amount of study uh, of our oceans, and, and that, that's what I'm pursuing right now. When you hear about Navy submarine seamen um, witnessing or noticing on sonar USO activity, objects that are moving, you know, 300 knots plus. I won't use the gentleman's name, uh, even though he's, he's mentioned it public, publicly and has been in print, that during some testing in the, uh, on the, the Los Angeles class improved 688, Los Angeles class fast chuck submarine, the USS Hampton, I think it's SSN 767, they were, they were doing something new with the sonar. And an object was, was being picked up on sonar as a, a fast mover. And it went, went zipping by him. And the sonar operator said, that went by us and in excess of 800 miles an hour. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. I was really uh, impressed by the different individuals you were able to get admiral gallaudet you were able to get richard dolan you know jim, uh, jim goodall was also a great catch there as well uh, i'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of uh bio work for you guys real quick here um if you don't mind um so this is the the movie we're talking about it's transmedium fast movers and usos and so we will get into a discussion on that shortly um this is darcy we're right here and that's admiral gallaudet with him this is just a little bit of a bio for Darcy. It says, Darcy Weir is a documentary filmmaker who over the past two decades has chosen to explore some of the most intriguing topics of discussion today, including UFOs, cryptids, and even Bitcoin. He has completed over 15 
feature length documentaries on these topics, all of which are available on Amazon Prime and Apple. Now, let me just add this real quick. If you look at the comments, the chat section, you're going to find links to both Amazon Prime and Apple as far as uh, being able to rent or buy the movie. It says his goal is to make the world of UFOs more accessible to the general public by shedding light on the subject in new ways. In relation to Darcy's latest film, here's something else. Director Darcy Weir announces that anticipated release of Transmediums, Fast Movers, and USOs featuring ex-Navy Chief Oceanographer Tim Gallaudet, a UAP-focused producer, director, and writer. Uh, Darcy Weir is known for his work on the secret space UFOs, Fast Walkers, secret space UFOs, Apollos 1 through 11, being taken, the unwanted Sasquatch, and the underground. So pretty good credentials there. Um, glad to have you on, Darcy. Now let's go ahead and move on to Andy Marcial. And so if you notice in the introduction, he is uh, his organization is called New York UAP Discussions, and I'll give you a quick bio of him. Um, Andy says, I am a researcher of 20 plus years who was forced down the rabbit hole after very personal and life changing close encounters. My entire life, all I have done is to try to understand what I've seen and why I went through what I went through. It changed me and showed me that there is an entire reality out there beyond human comprehension. It also drove me to reach out to others like myself because of how psychologically damaged, damaging this can be. I also recently leaked three Department of Homeland Security videos to the public, which were controversial. I don't do what I do for any other reason than to open the minds of anyone willing to listen to and to show the those affected by this phenomenon that they are not alone. Fearscape Paranormal says this about Andy. Andy is a popular influencer that broke the story in videos of the now famous rubber duck UAP on his social media. Andy has a keen eye for authentic UAP footage as well as a very dedicated opinion of the phenomena and the truth that is out there. And then the other person I wanted to highlight was Admiral Gallaudet. Um, he, uh, he basically broke the white papers and there's a lot here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip over this because I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, he wrote the white papers for the, the Soul Foundation. And that's kind of our newest scientific think group that is um, trying to unravel this mystery of UAPs. And so I'm going to go ahead and bring us all back up and just excited to have you guys here. Um, the movie was just, Phenomenal. I, I watched a, a bunch of it last night and uh, I'm telling you what, I was taking notes and it was amazing how much there's in there. But I think one of the things, Darcy, that we should start off with is let's define what transmedium means. And so how would you, to the average person, how would you define transmedium in a way that, that makes sense to them? Yeah. So, um, you know, a very early oceanographer in history was a guy named Jacques Cousteau. Uh, this is a famous uh, marine biologist that was studying our oceans. And um, he said, there's no such thing as throwing something away. Um, we exist in multiple mediums on the planet. We have the atmosphere, which is a gaseous fluid. And then we have the oceans, which are a fluid liquid water right? And 71% um, of our planet is covered by our oceans. And um, when these objects have been picked up by Navy personnel, uh, sometimes Air Force personnel that are intercepting them, these objects are seen coming from our oceans and sometimes going into our oceans. Um, and we're getting radar hits, we're getting uh, photography, videography, you know, gun cam footage, as most famously has, has happened since the releases of 2017. And um, what seems to be a commonly reported thing is that the objects exhibit the capability of moving from this gaseous atmosphere that surrounds our planet and going into our oceans unimpeded by typical frictions that our craft 
or our submarines or boats would be exhibited, uh, you know, would have to operate by, they end up going into our oceans, uh, unimpeded by friction, normal gra gravitational forces, and just uh, speed through our oceans beyond the capabilities that our known craft are able to. So that is that trans medium going from one medium to another without, uh, you know, d defying all laws of physics as we know. So it, do you think that that is a common um, thing for like what we call UAPs in the old days used to call UFOs? Do you think that the majority of them can do this or do you think all of them can do this? I don't know, um, but I think it's common enough uh, being reported throughout the decades, ocean-based sightings, um, sightings over Great Lakes, uh, going into these bodies of water and coming out of that um, many of them seem to demonstrate these transmedium capabilities. Yes. Uh, Carl Feint, who was a, a really well studied individual that was part of the UFO community since, you know, before the 1970s, he wrote a book called UFOs uh, and Water and described, you know, what he thought uh, witnesses were seeing would seem to be almost like a field being generated by these craft that allowed them to enter the water and not even be touched by the water. Right. And, um, you know, you fast forward to the Tic Tac incident and, uh, you've got commander Fravor and, um, Alex Dietrich seeing this Tic Tac shaped, uh, object white hovering over the ocean surface. And they both kind of recall that there might have been an, a larger object underneath the ocean surface, creating this froth of water. And um, they were curious about that object, as you would be, because, you know, you've got two things that are anomalous there. Um, what was causing that froth? Is it the fact that this object is displacing the water around it so it's not being touched by the water? Or is it physically you know, touching the water and has some kind of engine or something like that. I, I doubt it. Um, but we don't know. We don't know enough about that object. I think the Department of Defense and Navy probably have a bit more data on that. So, um, and, and, you know, it's not just civilian sightings, the uh, military and intelligence apparatus of many different uh, countries around the world, Russia, China, Britain, you know, um, Canada and the United States must know more about this uh, phenomenon than the general public knows. Well, we don't we don't know the makeup of these beings, whether they're biologics like we are. But I was just thinking about it because, you know, anything that can go from outer space into our environment and then go into the water, you would think it's some kind of a closed system you know, much like our submarines are, but able to do that. And so my question for you now is what kind of propulsion system do you think they operate with? Um, are we talking anti-gravity here or do you have any other theories? I wanted to get on to that, um, the last one, the, the Kaluza Klein theory a little bit later that I, that's the first I'd heard of it in your show, but I'd like to get to that. But before we get to that, let's talk about some other possibilities what kind of propulsion system do you think that they would need to be able to accomplish you know being able to go out into outer space being in our atmosphere in our air and then being able to go into our water yeah i andy, think andy you go for it man if you I want to let andy jump in on some of this too so so what are your thoughts andy um i don't uh, me personally i don't think it's anything like anti-gravity i mean if you want to use that term to describe it fine but i think it's a little more complicated than that um i mean in, in my opinion <clears throat> for many years before i even understood what anti-gravity was i used to you know kind of think about how could they possibly be doing these maneuvers or you know entering or exiting the water the way they do and it could be a manipulation of reality that they are capable of doing where they're able to warp reality itself in a manner where it may be that it looks like they're, they're moving, but they're technically really not. It's everything around it that's moving, you know? Like, it could be something along those lines. 
I mean, we, we just don't know, you know, uh, and that's just, that's, that's considering that, you know, that's only one species. <laughs> if there's multiple races, they could be using multiple forms of, of technology that, you know, uh, the propulsion is just odd to us, you know, or, or non-existent to us. Rob, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? I want to make sure that you get in here as well. Remember, you might be a little delayed. I was just, okay. Oh, I was just uh, thinking that they're probably using um, quantum field uh, energy where they're able to basically extract it, um, applying subatomic properties to macro um, objects. So they're not operating with the dropping with quantum mechanics, not, not uh, relativity to do, to power their craft and things. Well, yeah. the, beauty of, the beauty of this subject is we can speculate and I don't know that any of us can say we know it's this. And as Andy said, we're talking about multi multiple different species. And so, you know, it could be completely different technology. Now getting back to um, the issue of transmedium, do we need to maybe redefine our terms? I hate to do this. I know somebody's going to get mad at me for this, but maybe we should start calling them UTOs, unidentified transmedium objects, because if that's what they have the ability to do and they're not limited to one thing, you know, um, maybe that's a new term we ought to have adopted. And by the way, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. um, it makes sense. Yeah. As long as it's not a UTI, right? Um, yeah, that's definitely not one. I guess maybe it's too yeah. close to that. We'll have to come up with a better yeah. one, but yeah, those are no fun well, at all. I think the A would be anomalous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, anomalous. The A with being an anomalous would would work. Yeah, yeah. obviously. Yeah, I guess anomalous like, would probably cover that. The lexicon of um, the study of this phenomenon is broadening and expanding, and transmedium is just like part of that it's new right you know before we had ufos now we have uaps usos is actually old maybe usos when the uh military is starting to roll this out more to the public they might call usos something else they might call them utos you never know um but it's interesting that uh the dialogue is changing you know since lou elizondo came forward, we're getting more and more of this conversation happening in our daily lives and in the public than ever before. It really just lived on the fringe before. When I first started documenting this stuff, uh, the very first documentary I ever made was back in like 2012. And it just went on YouTube. It got 4 million hits. And um, it, you know, it showed me that I guess people like this stuff. And I'm interested in this stuff, so I'll keep doing it. And now, you know, so much time later, uh, like over 20 years, 10 years later, <laughs> um, I'm basically like bombarded by more and more truths that are coming out of the phenomenon. And I'm just doing my part to document that as factually or, um, you know, basically truthfully as possible um and do a service to people like andy who's an experiencer himself who witnessed ufos um and that was actually what gave him the energy to create a platform where other people were interested in ufos or uap would be able to discuss this together and that is how the department of homeland security agent eventually reached out to him and leaked these three now pretty interesting UAP videos. The um, A-10 Warthog video, I think is one of the best, this like sphere flying around. Um, the um, Bruja, La Bruja video, and as well the Rubber Duck, which is like a super long amount of footage of one object flying over mm -hmm. the border of Mexico and the United States, right? There are points of contention about that, but I think it's the fact it came from an agent who couldn't explain it that was working for the Department of Homeland Security amongst other people that had witnessed that. And they had filed that away in their weird shit folder that they had captured on 
you know, probably an MX-15 FLIR system. Um, and you got, got guys like Dave Falch, who uh, – Falch, sorry. He'll get mad if he hears this, and I mispronounced the last name. I always mispronounce it. <laughs> he came forward, and he did analysis of those same FLIR videos and says, look, I repair these systems. This is what a Mylar balloon looks like. This is what, you know um, – atmospheric or birds or the rear of jet engine of a, you know, uh, a fighter pilot, uh, craft would look like it's not that. So what is it? It must be some kind of UAP. Right. And I think, um, that's just, I'm really interested in, you know, if you look at my track record, I'm talking about UFOs, UAPs, USOs, I think there's something here that's interacting our planet. Um, is some of it non-human intelligence? I think so. It's possible. Scientifically, it has to be possible. Um, is some of it man-made? I think so. Pos it's possible. Have we made breakthroughs in some of these reverse engineering special access programs? I hope so. It's a lot of money that's poured into them, right? Through black budget and uh you know what's what's the funding every year to the pentagon you know <laughs> they slice off a little bit of that and maybe they get some some of the best and brightest to work on this stuff and they have made breakthroughs so uh anything's possible well it sure seems like there's a you know i know people don't like anecdotal evidence but there's a there's a ton of it when you when you listen to all the people and like i said even if you you know, you got rid of 95%, the last 5% would be overwhelming, you know, and that's one of the things I don't like about science is it won't even look at that. And in fact, a lot of scientists won't look at anything that's paranormal. And, and I've often argued, you know, hey, science is supposed to be curious. And so why are you so incurious as it now getting back to Andy a little bit. So Andy, because you're an experiencer, is that why you do what you do? Is that what your um, UAP discussion group is all about to help other experiencers? Or is it broader than that? That's actually what originally pushed me to create the, the account, yeah. <clears throat> um, because I, I, you know, I understand what, like I, you know, like you, you read in the bio, like I, I know what this can do to people. You know, I, I've met individuals that, you know, it, it's not always a positive experience for people because um, it's, it's, it's reality changing, you know. This is why I, I kind of... I kind of began to lean towards the fact that I, I I don't think that humans are really ready for what they're looking for or what they want to see. Um, you know, they they paint these beautiful pictures in their mind of how it's going to turn out. You know, they they uh, see movies and stuff, and they think that you know ET are here to help us and all this. And I I honestly, based off of my own experiences, it's nothing like that. Um, and the to see this in in person is 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 I mean I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just like it it changes your entire perspective of reality, you know, because it's it, it's something that should not exist that you're told doesn't exist, but yet there it is right in front of you. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but it's real and it's there, you know, and. When I think about the fact that some people who have, who have actually had uh, experience with the beings and have seen them, if just seeing the craft up close the way I did uh, change my life the way it did, I could just imagine what it is to, to see an actual being up close and in real life, you know, uh, flesh right there in front of you. That's got to be incredibly traumatizing, you know. So I personally don't think a lot of people are really ready for what they're asking for. Um and I, I, I don't know how it's going to present itself to us, you know, eventually. But I think that's one of the reasons why it really hasn't come out in that manner, because it's just going to be personally, I think it's going to be too much if it, you know, exposes itself or it comes out in the manner that, you know, a lot of people are, are, are hoping for or looking for. Like, I, yeah. I just don't think they're going to be able to handle it. It's like, uh, you know, what David Grush um explains is that ontological shock right we have experiencers and military personnel that have 
chased these craft or been um, hired to, you know, scramble uh, a, a fighter jet and intercept them over the Gulf of New Mexico. You've got the Eglin Air Force Base incident that happened in January of last year. Um, two fighter craft uh, scrambled to intercept uh, four objects flying over the Gulf of New Mexico, right? So, or Gulf of Mexico, my bad. So you've got a lot of that happening. And then you got people like Andy who are civilians that witness this phenomenon. And imagine how startling that is to your own physical and mental reality. You're not used to thinking about this existing and it quite literally does exist. It's here and it's always been here maybe. Right. So then you amplify that. Obviously, anybody who's been read into this or educated themselves on it, let's call it the UFO community or the uh, UAP research uh, enthusiasts. They're all that advocating for this stuff to just come out, like just release the floodgates. Let Poseidon just send a tidal wave of disclosure over the planet and just inform everybody about the truth of this subject but there are implications that this could be like a worldwide ontological shock this could disrupt certain social systems yeah religion and the economy who knows right it's hard uh when i i never had an up close and personal experience like andy had with the ufo I have seen stuff in the distance and one time when I was on a commercial flight and uh, I did, you know, think I was crazy when I first saw that and, and thought maybe I'm just reading into this. Maybe I didn't actually see that. And, you know, I was in my early 20s. I think it was like 2021. Um, and it's hard to go back to work and to just like, sink right back into a, a normal job after that. Um, mm -hmm. I mentioned this before I was working in like an insurance sales role and I didn't like it. And I didn't feel like the reality I was working in was real. I just felt that ontological shock. My psyche was shook when I started realizing that there's more than just us maybe and that there's a truth that's being kept from the general public, right? Um, so imagine everybody goes through that. It might be disruptive to the economy. It might be disruptive to um, what the powers that be really want out of us is productivity, right? So um, disclosure is tricky, I think. Well, the one thing we have to also consider, because I mean, I've heard that, um, Robert Bigelow basically said, we're not ready for it. But then I think about all the people like Stanton Freedom, Friedman, you know, I think of Bud Hopkins, I think of John Mack, I think of all of those that worked so hard because part of the reason I think we want disclosure and I'm with you, Darcy, we want to do it the right way. We don't want it to be catastrophic disclosure, but um, there's a lot of people that are treated like they're crazy because they've gone through experiences like Andy and, and I've got lots of friends who are abductees. And the truth of the matter is I have people that think it was a good thing. And I got people who think it's the worst, most evil thing in the world. And I believe both of them. In fact, uh, one of my friends hiking abductee, we were just talking about this and that's exactly what I told her. And, and my reasoning on it is probably we are dealing with multiple species and some of them aren't so nice and some of them aren't so friendly. But the argument I make is, for some reason, we're still here. And so if they were completely wicked, every one of them were, I don't know how we would still be here. Um, but I, I understand it's a balancing act. I just feel sorry, though, for and, and I've got friends that aren't are, aren't too young anymore. I'm, I'm kind of getting in that category and they would really like to see disclosure in their lifetime. And so there's got to be some way of doing it without ripping our world apart, because like I said, there's a lot of people being affected very negatively, you know, especially those from Andy's group who have seen something that's genuine 
they need to talk about it. And thankfully, we're getting in an age where it's easier to do that. But um, otherwise, then they start thinking what you did, Darcy. Hey, maybe I'm crazy. You know, maybe they are right. Maybe there's something wrong with me. When in reality, all they had is just this, this phenomena hit them and they had no no answer for it. Now, getting back on, on target a little bit, um, I want to get back to the USOs. Um, do you, uh, this is to anybody who wants to answer, but specifically to Darcy, do you think it's a given that there are alien cities or whatever these USOs are going to? There has to be a reason they're going in the water. And so um, let me start with you, Darcy. Do you think it's a given that there are alien cities or civilizations or something in our water, in our oceans? I think it's a possibility. Um, you know, again, this object that the Tic Tac incident uh, exhibited, there was something under the water there that was much larger. Um, Chris Sharp, who runs Liberation Times in the UK, he wrote an article about how there's apparently the whole scientific report regarding uh, data that has been recorded by the Navy that tracked this large object that was emanating the Tic Tacs for days within the ocean. So yeah, I think that would be, I think that's non-human. I don't know if that's Russian or China, but I'm pretty sure it's not. I think the Americans know what they've got and I hope they're not spoofing their own Navy with some kind of black technology that's emanating Tic Tacs, but I doubt it. You know, I, I don't think so. I think this is something greater than us. And, um, you know, I've talked before about other theorists who've projected the idea that there's a non-human intelligence that's existed on Earth, if not longer, maybe the same amount of time as us, but they're like this breakaway civilization that um, maybe evolved quicker and, and used technology differently than us and um, are less at war with each other and more so doing things in a research way. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got guys like Hal Putoff who wrote the ultra terrestrials paper not too long ago, alluding to the idea of these crypto terrestrials, ultra, ter ultra terrestrials living in a different domain on our planet, around our planet. Maybe that's dimensional. Maybe that domain is the ocean. And um, you've got Lou Elizondo, who um, was asked once, what would be a good uh, book to describe this phenomenon? He said, Tears of the Sea, which is a fiction book, but it addresses this plurality of um, anomalous phenomenon and non-human intelligence. It talks about extraterrestrial intelligence. It talks about um, other non-human intelligence existing here on Earth that are actually the masters of Earth. Um, and Earthlings, humans, are just not in in the know about that fully, right? Uh, and then it also talks about AI. Um, so what, what you know, some of these objects could be something like a von, von Neumann probe, you know, that are uh, coming into our planet or orbiting around our planet in space, self-replicating, researching us uh, with just an artificial intelligent brain, who knows, that are from an extraterrestrial source. Um, this all lives in reality as a possibility, but with our current scientific open understanding of science, it's not proven yet. Right. Well, one of the things that that I think a lot about, and it was in your your movie um, when I was in the Navy, I remember I was on a Spurns class destroyer and I remember our top speed was about thirty five knots. And so as we look at the, the stuff that was portrayed in your movie, they're talking about subs that that's our subs. That's pretty much their you know top rate of speed as well. And then they got looking at the um, super cavitating torpedoes, and those can go about 200 knots. But 
you saw in the clip earlier, it's your movie, so you know mm -hmm. it better than anyone, but where John Goodall talked about the um, the Hampton seeing some kind of fast mover going 800 miles per hour. And that's about 695 miles an hour at knots. 800 knots is 695 miles. I'm sorry, got that backwards. 800 miles an hour, 695 knots. I think uh, for each yeah. mile, it's 1.15 um, knots and stuff. So when you're talking about something going, you know, 800 miles an hour, and what we have, the closest we have is, you know, around 200 knots. And so this is three times faster, more than three times faster than the best we have right now. I'm just like, well, how do we explain that? I mean, how do we explain something that's beyond, and you could talk about black op projects, but the reality is a lot of this has been seen for decades. I mean, these triangles and stuff like that, those go date back to the fifties. And, and, you know, some of the stuff we're seeing today could be, you know, our stuff, you know, it could be reverse engineered stuff that we've done, but I think there was one video clip you had where you talked about it coming, a triangle coming out of the water. And I don't, I don't know. We have, you know, even if we've developed, you know, black triangles, you know, um, I don't know that we've developed any that are transmedium yet. Is that correct? So, what are you guys thinking on on what they're seeing in the ocean, Rob? You got any ideas on that? Well, yeah. Um, one of the fundamentals we need to remember is that every technology that humans that we are aware of is highly disruptive to the environment that they're moving in, whether it's the atmosphere or, you know, we can't gauge space, obviously, but um, moving at any speed, 200, 300 knots, at least, they're gonna cause major disruptions in the water. Um, and the, these anomalous craft are not doing that. They're they are moving through it without disturbing the atomic mass of the ocean. So it's an entirely different spectrum of uh, craft. I don't think we're dealing with one type of phenomena or I think we're dealing with a combination of multiple things because history does show that uh, there's been advanced paleo contract in the contact in the past of earlier humans that are still left a lot of traces on the planet that indicate that. And uh, the frequency that we have now that they're communicating in more frequency and volume indicates that we it may not be left up to humans of when we have disclosure. It may be on their terms if we don't do it on our terms, and there's not just one them out there. Right. It's not A, B, C, or D. It's all of the above. You know, if you listen to people in the different descriptions. So, Andy, what what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, actually, I, I find I find it uh, I find it interesting that no one ever thinks of how they're maneuvering at those speeds. Yeah, everybody always focuses on the technology, focuses, oh, they're going so fast. But, you know, to this, to, to, and e to easily disprove that it ha that could be United States or Russia or any superpower is how do you operate a craft under the water or in the oceans at those type of speeds? Like if you're talking 800 miles per hour under the water, how do you maneuver in time to get out of the way of anything in front of you? How do you do that while you're in the air traveling at 30, 40,000 miles per hour? You know, like those are things you also have to consider and think about as well. What are the what are the methods of maneuverability at those th speeds at those? You know, like like um, I mean, just think about it. You know, like we just had a, a different discussion with another group. And I brought up the um, the um, f the Gulf breeze footage where that object early, I think it was in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken that um, the sphere that was just there in one second and gone the next, you could see that it shot off. There was, I mean, clear indication that it didn't just teleport. It went from zero to whatever, 30,000 miles per hour in a split second. How do you maneuver? How mm -hmm. do you operate a craft like that without slamming into even a bird? I mean, I just saw a video recently of a Cessna, I think it was, or something like that, that slammed into a crane and the the guy almost died, you know, because the, the 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 wing almost came off. Like, imagine going at those speeds and slamming into something. You know, it's 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 crazy to think about what you need 
in order to operate something like that. It's not like a, a gas pedal and a steering wheel, you know, like you have to have something even more complex than the object that is, is, is traveling at these speeds in order to actually operate it properly. Well, that, you, it's interesting you brought that up because it mm -hmm. reminded me in our Navy days, you know, when we had to, we would be going flank and then they wanted to automatically try to stop us. There was some way that they could reverse the screws and it would start cavitating the other way. But, or it's like a train, you know, you get a train, you get somebody on the tracks. It's like how you can, you just can't stop on a dime. And yet that's what they do. Lou was talking about that. I can't remember which uh, one of our jets he was talking about. He said to make a, a right turn, it would like take at that speed, it would take, you know, almost a full state to be able to do it. And yet these things seem to do it instantaneously, these right angle turns. And, and I've watched videos of them too. And it's just like, they, we, we don't have anything that can do that. And I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's, I'm sorry, could you, before I forget this, there. but it, it, it's not just the, you know, like also you have to think about is there, um, the their erratic movement right some of these things are seen doing you know doing making maneuvers that just don't make any sense for flight you know like like i mean we get in a plane we go straight because we're trying to get to our destination there's videos where this thing will be going in one direction all, all of a sudden stop and go back the other direction and then shoot off to another direction and it's like what are they doing you know what i'm saying but when you think about it they're at least me i've thought about it is the, we have organisms on this planet that do the exact same thing, right? And one of one of the ones that I think about that come that came to mind when I started trying to understand that part of the phenomenon is just the movement, the erratic movement. Look at look at um, dragonflies. Yeah. Dragonflies are unpredictable in flight. They go any direction they want, backwards, forwards, upside down. Their their vision is incredible. They could see a BB a BB gun you know, BB being shot out of a gun and track it in flight. I mean, it's, I've seen the video where they slow it down and this insect, this living organism can track this BB. And it's like if, if an organism on this planet that we know of can do things like that, and maybe it's possible that something else out there might have some sort of similar ability. And that's kind of why we see this erratic movement or these, these things that just don't make sense to us because it's something similar that they might share with, you know, creatures we actually have here on this planet as well. Yeah, it does seem strange that we we got point A to point B, and it's like they've got ten pit steps on the way <laughs> to get to point B as well. I did want to ask uh, Darcy a question because as I was watching it, um, I think it was Mark D'Antonio was talking about. I don't remember if he said it was his only visit on a submarine, but anyway, he was on one and. They actually encountered one of the things, and and then the sailor or whoever was next to him said, um, "You know, fast mover." And so there seems to be a little bit of confusion. I thought Admiral Gallaudet maybe defined it, but even with that, he, he, you know, fast movers is that what they're called, or is that a program? Is that just a secret code to identify them? That's what I'm trying to because I know there's another name that they use, and we'll get to that in a second. That's the but when we talk about fast movers, they I think talked about program or secret name. Is that just the the way that you know the brass identifies it? And yet maybe the sailors have their own name, and that is jellyfish. I mean, so I'm, I was yeah. trying to put my mind wrap my mind around yeah. is it fast movers or is it jellyfish? Well, I think um, what he was alluding to is that there seems to be a program to catalog them. Um, the debrief did that article about this supposed fast mover program within the Navy where they're cataloging them and USOs were mentioned by high ranking military officials and intelligence officers. Um, that's really where that black triangle coming out of the ocean story comes from that was apparently circulating in 2019 within That's the right. intelligence agencies and um you know that would have been possibly one of these intelligence agencies that david grush was interacting with you know um bob mcguire this guy uh he said that he actually saw the black triangle physically himself the picture 
that was going through the intelligence agencies at that time. Um, so, yeah, I think with Mark D'Antonio's experience of a fast mover being announced when he was in the sonar shack right. and the XO came over and wanted to find out what the sonar operator was declaring they just detected. Um, that just kind of like alludes to the idea that they're cataloging these ocean based ob objects that are highly anomalous. And um, when he asked around, he would find out more from other Navy submariners that they often just catalog them as jellyfish to gloss over them because they just aren't threatened all the time by them, but they know that they're available to detection. And sometimes they're being ca categorized as fast movers, which, um, you know, later on he had a chance supposedly to sit down with the second in command for the Navy. Um, he was invited for a dinner at this gentleman's house. And um, that individual said when Mark D'Antonio asked him, sir, what can you tell me about the fast mover program? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that Mark had done enough research to that point that he had found out there might have been a special access program where this is actively being researched in our oceans. And that second in command for the Navy said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you about that, Mark. I can't so, tell you. Not, not a program like it's something that we're building and we're operating. It's they have just to use terms that aren't going to be foyable and discoverable right either. So they're going to have they're going to have yeah i when you when i first when you were talking at first i was going to say so maybe um fast movers is the official name and jellyfish is the slang name but it sounds you know maybe that's not 100 percent accurate but what do you think of that yeah probably slang or we don't care name uh just to basically now the other question is why in the world jellyfish why in the world of all the things they could have you know come up with what was the reason that they picked jellyfish any idea well just a code name to signify something that first of all is maybe yeah. not a threat yeah maybe not a threat because jellyfish are not a threat to any equipment that we have in the ocean um, and second of all, they don't emit noise at all. Like literally they don't. So if, if sonar is not detecting an object and somebody's categorizing it as a jellyfish, that might set off some curiosity to the folks that are looking at those cataloged code names and they're going, Oh, we've got another jellyfish, right? Something that's, not supposed to even emit sound in the ocean or have a, a signature in the ocean, not sound, but a signature, let's say, um, on sonar. So what the heck, what the hell is that? Well, I loved it though. When Mark was talking about the event with the fast mover, he thought when they said that, that there was a torpedo <laughs> that was coming after him and he's like, Hey, this is, this is the end. I love that. Now, what about the, jellyfish video that jeremy put out I, I guess it didn't show in the video but i've heard that at the end that the jellyfish went in the water and that's why i was wondering is there a connection between the two or is that just coincidence well look um it's just another case where we hear about an anomalous object going to the ocean um into the ocean and actually, if you listen to what he says, he also reports that in the longer format of that video or the eyewitness testimony of the people that were tracking that object, the whole duration that it was trackable, it went into the ocean, but then it later on came out of the ocean and shot off into the sky at a very high rate of speed. You know, that's something highly anomalous. And uh, I guess I don't know enough about it to really comment, but it just seems to, you know, uh, be related to this UAP phenomenon. 
Well, definitely not a drone, as some people are saying. I don't think we have any drones that can do that. Now, I did have a couple of, of questions, and uh, you know one of the gentlemen. He goes by Sir Gasbo, Truth Reaper 61, Gary. He's a friend of mine as well. But he had a question for you. He said, you guys were talking about it. He said, I was discussing with Darcy around the acronym NHI. We both agreed that the term NHI is not accurate enough to describe the others. Um, seeing as how anything that swims in the ocean or flies in the sky or moves across the land, if not human, is actually NHI. You could argue that the portion of intelligence varies greatly species to species, but it still doesn't split the others from the rest. I wonder if he'd had any further thought on that, on redefining, separating like marine life when you're talking about non-human intelligence. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, uh, that's a really good point on Twitter he made. And uh, with Tim Gallaudet's Saul Foundation paper on investigating our oceans and non-human intelligence, you know, he is saying quite evidently that in science, you know, marine biology, we have whales, dolphins, seals, all kinds of intelligence living in our oceans. Um, but if you extend that further, you look at agencies like NASA, they are actually, they've been actively developing research programs where they could send a rocket to the um, planetoid Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter. And this is a water-based uh, liquid uh, planet that has a, a ice crust. And they're looking at possibly boring through that with possibly like a superheated tip to some kind of submersible that would get through the ice, get to this ocean that they know is under the ice based on their scientific cal calculations. Um, and they know that it, the core of that planet is heated. So it has that water, um, you know, um, zone in between the, uh, the core and the ice crust of the planet. So is there intelligent life? Is there a non-human intelligence swimming in the oceans of Europa? We've always wondered that. And uh, is it possible that a non-human intelligence had evolved from elsewhere, from a non-human uh, origin somewhere in our galaxy uh, that was an ocean-based planet and they've learned to evolve and use technology and now they're visiting us and maybe the oceans of our planet is where they prefer to hang out and carry out their anthropo anthropological studies of us and our planet because it's out of sight it's out of sound and uh it's safety safer for them because we don't have mastery of of the oceans yet i mean tim gallaudet speaks about um the fact that we don't know the um, ocean volumes of our of, of our planet to precise scientific um, measurements and and uh, knowledge yet. We to the ocean volume the the question is probably about five percent that's been mapped or understood, right. but our ocean beds the the actual. Um, bottom of the ocean, we've only got 25% mapped. And, and that's like not even to the same technological um, standard that we can map at this point, you know, with satellite, sonar, and uh, all kinds of mapping technologies. We started and embarked on that sort of mapping exercise back in the 1800s. And some of those maps we're still using today, you know, so that's out of date. Um, there's a lot of unknowns about our ocean and a non-human intelligence residing there that's greater than just a mammal or a, um, you know, squid and cephalopod or something like that. Uh, it could be possible. We just don't know in the public yet. And maybe what our navies and our Air Force, um, maybe even NOAA, our science agencies know about something in our oceans that's greater than us 
but it's just not public yet. I don't know. Well, I think it was probably a little broader than that. I can understand exactly what you were saying and going there. But I mean, we're talking about being, I mean, animals on the planet. And so how do we distinguish when you say non-human? You could be talking about an ape. You could be talking about a chicken. Now, one of the things I heard was a non-human higher intelligence as a possible one. I don't remember who brought that up. But Andy uh, Cheshire uh, also had a comment about this. He said, regarding the NHI terminology, it got me thinking, non-human technological, biological intelligence and his acronym um, is NHTBI. And, and Andy's a really, really good guy, a really good supporter. He says, it's an upper term umbrella that covers everything associated under the sun. And so you, you're covering your, you know, whether these ETs are sending over their drones and stuff with AI or whatever, you're covering everything. But I don't know that we're going to solve that in in one simple um, conversation. Now, one thing I did like is um, that Admiral um, Gallaudet brought up, you know, that he had seen a film and it didn't take very long to figure out exactly what film that was. And so he was talking about the go fast. And uh, I think people have probably heard this as well, but he talked about getting that email that said urgent safety of flight issue. And it was given to like about 20 different admirals. And, uh, and it was like, wow. And then they deleted it. And so why do you think that that was deleted? Okay. So first you have, um, the case you're talking about is uh, during Tim Gallaudet's service for the Navy, he was chief oceanographer within that 32 years of service. Um, and he was active on the exercises that um, Ryan Graves was flying in which he saw this um, cube within a sphere object that almost collided in between the, his jet and the other jet pacing this thing. Um, and that was off the coast of Virginia. Um, I think this is at the exact same time that the go fast UFO video was captured. That's now famous. NASA had embarked in the past two years on a, um, uh, you know, research of that video and that case. And they explained it away as being, um, an object just moving at about like 40 miles per hour. So really they're trying to debunk that. And I know that um, Sean Kirkpatrick uh, also published in his recent Aero report that, oh, NASA already figured out what the go fast UFO is or UAP video. So that's been debunked. I think there is an attempt from a mainstream, um, very, uh, well-accredited scientific institution to be a tip of the spear for debunking this phenomenon in the public now, and that is NASA. It's really disappointing because when um, Bill Nelson first came out as the NASA administrator, this is an STS mission uh, astronaut who has actually been to space Um in service of building the International Space Station during the 90s and the 2000s. Um, you know, he came out and said, I saw the UAP videos and I've spoken to the pilots and uh, I think there is something here to, uh, to be investigated. And I hope NASA researches and, and uh, I would like to be part of the UAP research program. And so... When I saw that declaration to the public, I was excited. Maybe this is the disclosure moment. This is where a mainstream scientific um, apparatus that's really extricably linked to the Air Force since its in inception and definitely the Navy, which is the top of our intelligence and defense um, around the world, maybe they're going to make inroads to disclosure through NASA being part of that, but really NASA has been debunking. And that video that Tim Gallaudet saw when he and others within that chain 
of that email chain, that thread, were being alerted of this object. They were saying that this is one of many objects that have been interfering with the exercise out there in the ocean. Um, and that was just one video that they were alerting to people like Tim Gallaudet, who is in charge of trying to predict things that could get in the way of these ocean-based exercises, right? Like weather, ocean uh, phenomenon, like tidal uh, waves and so on and so forth. So this was a safety of flight risk. That's what it was clearly mentioned in that email thread. And that's not something to be taken lightly. We're talking about millions of dollars in investment, planning going into these exercises out in the middle of the ocean. It's not something you want to scrap. And they were literally mentioning in that email, should we scrap the exercise because of this safety of flight, these objects that are out there um, that shouldn't be there. And when he said he looked at that video, the first thing he and another person who's a civilian scientist, part of that classified, um, you know, research thread said was that looks like non-human technology. It's like this oblong shaped sort of sphere object that's flying over the ocean in the middle of nowhere. That's not drone technology because we still need traditional flight surfaces like wings and an engine for propulsion. This is something that's going against the wind, regardless of NASA trying to debunk it and say, oh, that's only traveling at 40 miles per hour or something. Um, what is it? Why is it there? And why would our state-of-the-art fighter aircraft be tracking it? It's definitely not a balloon. Again, FLIR would not sh make it show up as white hot as an object flying over the ocean. Um, it seems to be anomalous. So it, it's just, uh, it's, it's a shame that NASA got involved in debunking that. And um, again, it's one of many objects that were interfering with that exercise at the time. Well, I find it interesting you brought up Bill Nelson's name because um, I remember when he first started, you know, that NASA was gonna get involved, they were going to do that. I, I was very hopeful. Because I, I felt like he was a great ally. And and then I think about, you know, Senator Gillibrand and I think Mike Gallagher were ones in the, I think, the first hearing. And, you know, Mike Gallagher is actually stepping down. And Gillibrand, I asked Matt about it, and I'm not really sure if she's working behind the scenes or she's just disengaged. But I was looking at the third hearing, and I was just thinking about all the excitement that we had as we, you know, we had this issue front and center and everybody was talking about it. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on X. I've got, a, you know, like you, I've got a lot of followers and I'm hearing a sentiment like, you know, it's like we're losing, you know, like we've lost our momentum. People are just being super negative. And uh, I don't believe that, but I'm, I was wondering, let's start with Andy. What's your thoughts on that? As far as the state of disclosure. Well, I think with what happened with um, Kirkpatrick and, you know, the way he kind of pissed everyone off with that report, you know, downplaying this whole thing the way he did. Um, I think what's going to happen is that it, it's it's going to push an individual out there with the right information to just say F it and come forward. Um, because it's clear that we're not going to get the information from these individuals. We're not going to get it from military. We're not going to get it from the uh, quote unquote proper channels. Um, so I think that's how it's going to happen, honestly. And it, and it, you know, a good example of that was uh, Ross Coltart when he spoke to Daniel Sheehan and he was, you know, really upset at the entire thing as well and decided to come forward with his testimony about seeing the photos of the um, downed craft back in, uh, what was it? I think it was the 70s or something like that he, he mentioned that he had seen it. And I think in that manner is how this is going to unfold. And if it's not going to be in that way, it will eventually have to be with them, you know, ET or whatever this is itself, making itself known to us, which that could also be a, a, a possibility as well. 
You know, it could be one of the reasons why this even came out in the manner that it did, because maybe there was something that they had no control over that was going to eventually happen in the, you know, near future that, you know, factions within government and military uh, wanted to get this out while others did not. I mean, and I have heard that. I have heard that behind the scenes, it's almost uh, something like a civil war going on with when it comes to this information where you have a group that does want this information out while you have the other that is, you know, um, fighting against it. So it could it could be something like that. You know, you never know. I mean, especially now that we're we've gotten to the point where this is um, been admitted by Pentagon, has been admitted by, you know, all of these uh, organizations that at one at one point, you know, considered it kooky talk. And now they admit to it, then go back and deny it. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, it's it's almost similar to what happened with Roswell. You know, that, oh, yeah, we got a down saucer. And then the next day, oh, no, we don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, basically, it's the exact same thing happening all over again. But um, I think I think it's a good thing, even though it's disappointing, especially like when we were talking about you guys mentioning with this guy with NASA. I was hopeful, too. And then I got upset at it, but I think it's a good thing that they are pissing people off because right. it's going to get individuals to just come forward and, and risk everything to get the information out. If it's something that, you know, is that important that people do really need to know about, um, I, I have a feeling that's more than likely how it's going to happen. I'm talking about Errol, you know, my analogy is, and we didn't know it, is that that was just Project Blue Book 2.0. We didn't know it. The good thing is, like you said, now we know. Now we know exactly. And, you know, um, the other thing about the, the Arrow report, to me, that was equivalent to the Condon report. You know, the idea to try to shut this down. And I've, I've talked to Steve Bassett about it as well. And and he made a good point. And he's not the only one to say it. But, you know, when you get into the, uh, to the, 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 the red zone and you get close they're going to fight a lot harder because we're getting close. And I think that's what we've experienced. I think what people want to know right now, and I think what we need to make sure we get the word out, what they want to know is, can we win? Because I get an, an idea that a lot of people right now don't think we can win. And so I try to be a positive voice. And I think it's what each one of us needs to do. And so what are your thoughts on it, Rob, you know, about, the state of disclosure right now. You, uh, one thing you guys need to know about Rob is that he's a very, very close friend of Lou Elizondo. And so him and Lou talk quite a bit. So what, what's your thought? Because, you know, not that Lou's giving any national secrets away, national security secrets away, but um, he, I know he is working behind the scenes. He's come publicly and said that. But Rob, what do you think about it? Which part? Just the idea of the state of disclosure, disclosure right in general. Now. It's the Arrow report since what NASA did. All they the don't want to admit stuff. that they don't know what exactly. But what do we say to the average person? NASA went off of unclassified data, and uh, our government doesn't want to admit that they don't know what it. Yeah, I think I think yeah. Um, he was mentioning and they can't Rob stop it if they did. Yeah, I think it's like a sorry, I'll just help out Rob here. He was just putting in the private chat here that there is two competing factions within the intelligence community uh, regarding this issue and that the U.S. government is not uh, one accord and um, that they don't want the general public to know that we we don't know exactly what these objects are and that their capabilities are more advanced than our technology so um you know that's threatening and um shows that we don't have that superiority and security that most people expect from the united states government and their military apparatus right um yeah he was mentioning that the arrow report was and NASA's report was all based off of unclassified data. But really what we do need is the classified data, the stuff that sits in that massive, you know, 
uh, repository that, um, you know, so many people apparently have had their eyes peeking into like Lou or um, uh, Senator Harry Reid, who was part of the Gang of Eight, mentioned that there's this mountain of data, video, picture, and probably uh, telemetry, radar data that's been recorded around the world uh, from credible incidents regarding UAP or UFOs that the public's just not privy to, right? Um, it's only the IC, the intelligence community, and the military that probably are allowed to see that in special access programs. So I think, um, yeah, definitely disclosures at a, this impasse right now. But one of the things that I'm trying to do, you know, in my own small way as a, um, you know, content creator is to speak with very interesting people that have information about this phenomenon and try and get that out to a broader group. Um, try to expose the truth of this reality in whatever way I can, right? And um, you see kind of like this battle going on in terms of the UFO Twitter community, um, a lot of like defamation being thrown around and people trying to throw each other under the bus. And it's really disheartening, right? It, it's coming right after we had two disheartening um, incidents that happened to the mainstream community where Arrow and NASA both did their best to say there's nothing to see here, folks. Whereas experiencers and military and intelligence personnel are saying, and gov um, you know, people like Chris, Chris Mellon, who was a former government uh, worker, are saying there is something to see here. We know that there's something to see here that's highly anomalous, that's well beyond our earthly capabilities and understanding at this point, right? So, um, yeah, I think like there's people like my friend Nick Gold who is advocating with his platform called Declassify UAP. He's really trying to push for uh, a better understanding of that classified area within the government um, and the way politics is working to move this issue forward of UAP and uh, an understanding from a legislation, uh, le legislation perspective. So I really like the type of work he's doing, um, you know, and then you just have people that are constantly questioning this from a mainstream perspective, like, never before. Um, and, uh, you know, all kinds of influencers on Instagram or uh, YouTube or television. And, uh, you know, you got guys like Matt Ford, who used to produce and work for Bill Maher, and even Bill Maher himself, who's like an HBO journalist, who recently has been saying on his live show, there's UAP or UFO incidents that have been happening that our military and intelligence personnel know about. And like, why isn't the general public speaking about this more? So it's slowly permeating into the, the masses. Um, but I feel like disclosure is going to be a slow process. It's, it, it can't be that fast process like we talked about before where it's catastrophic because it could be catastrophic to um, certain sections of society, the economy, so on and so forth, if it just kind of drops in, in this huge, huge way. Although I do want more whistleblowers to come forward now that the Arrow report was a nothing burger. You know, I want people to watch films like I've made and be motivated to speak out. Like um, Frank Milburn, recently came out a, uh, you know, former um, active member of the UK military who talked about the UK's crash retrieval program. I think that's great progress. We need more um, people coming forward. 
Yeah, well, I think um, James Fox has got a movie coming out in May that supposedly has a whistleblower in it. I, I guess the issue is that you hit the nail on the head is the evidence is there. There's not a question about it. There's been too many people that have come out. It's just how in the world do we get there? And especially you're talking about legislatively. Um, we know Schumer and Rounds tried to do that. And even something as simple as a nine person panel to do what they did, like with the Kennedy um, papers, we couldn't even get that. And so that's where I think part of the frustration is, is we know uh, where it is. And I guess my question is, um, Kirkpatrick got so vindictive on this that he it, did he really even look or was it just a matter of his hands being tied? That's what I'm still trying to figure out, because, I mean, he's basically just trying to destroy um, the idea that there are extraterrestrials, that this is basically you give me enough time, I'll explain it all. But he, you said it yourself. He didn't get to see the best material and he's acting like he did. And so I don't know. What do you? Yeah, it's it's why uh, David Grush was reluctant to testify and submit his information to Arrow, because he knew that they had not the security clearance to access the information he wanted to talk about. Right. right? So it was kind of like a predestined de dead end mission, right? To be a credible um, research group that's going to have access to the things that whistleblowers like David Grush or, or uh, apparently these 40 people that were all interviewed by him that are waiting in the wings um, might be privy to more information than what Arrow is even capable of observing. Um, I wanted to go ahead and circle back to what we were talking about earlier because we're probably getting close to the end of our time. And I wanted to, because this is something new to me. I don't know if, if it was new to you or if this is something that that you know, any of the three of you have studied, but the Kaluza Klein theory. And and uh, I'll just give a brief under, of how I understood it. And it, I'm sure it's much more complicated. It has something to do with the fifth dimension, has to do with um, gra gravity and electromagnetism. I can't quite say that right. But anyway, um, it's it's getting back to where we said, we, you know, we were used to a straight line. And so when we look at the, you know, the uh, Tic Tac or other, but especially Tic Tac, where it seems to be in some cases 80,000 feet, other cases 28,000 and less than a second, it's at sea level. And so we think it, you know, I think Rob and I were talking about this earlier. We think, well, it just went 17,000 miles an hour. But this Kaluza Klein theory is kind of like it's not really moving as much as it's going, you know, going through a different like the fifth dimension. And it goes from here to here to here to here to here. And so it's not really like it's going 17,000 miles an hour. And then I remember it was Andy, whoever brought it up earlier, then it's taking all these side courses. <laughs> Some of them are and stuff. So. Can you explain that better than I just did? That's the best that I can explain it because I don't, I don't, I haven't really studied it deeply. Um, I just watched that part last night. Um, yeah, I think Mark D'Antonio touched on the idea that all of these particle accelerators that are around the world, like there's one in Chile that's starting to test these different particles that exist. Um, and, you know, there's the famous CERN one, which is on the, in Switzerland, that area. Um, they're looking for particles that could explain the forces of our gravity, our, our uh, reality, right? Like explain why the apple falls type thing. And he said that there was a, uh, particle theory called the Kaluza Klein particle that was discovered and, and theorized about some time ago. And they're just starting to test that out. And they're finding that um, a byproduct of the Kaluza Klein particle is something called the graviton. And they're starting to maybe decipher that this graviton is, you know, this, for lack of a better word, uh, possible like gravity explanation to um, 
this quantum world in which we could test out ways to open a, a micro black hole and close it and send objects through it and, you know, travel without the typical point A to point B um, locomotion, right? And, and so um, he theorizes maybe some of these UAP or UFOs that we're witnessing are demonstrating this ability to move through space and time by like teleporting pretty much, right? Like opening up successive um, holes and poking through them in reality and popping out to a different point and time. And he explains that might be why people like Kevin Day are witnessing an object going from 20,000 or 80,000 feet and appearing in both in within, you know, a second apart from each other. So um, that might be this like quasi particle CERN technology that's being uh, played out in front of us, but we're like a thousand years behind in terms of actually testing it out practically in, in um, you know, a material science uh, world. We're just theorizing about it right now and trying to observe it at this point. And maybe some of these craft and this non-human intelligence existence is exemplary of that breakthrough in science actually happening. And, and we're, we're, we're looking at that and trying to understand it. Just want to let you know your buddies there, Rob. It's good to see you, Shannon. Glad to have you with us and stuff. Um, yeah, another thing I wanted to steer towards, uh, I guess before I do that, I wanted to come back. Um, with what you described, um, would that be a portal? Basically, that they open a portal. Pretty much. And so that concept's kind of been there, but yeah, much more detailed, much more technical than anything that, that I have studied. Now, the other thing, uh, as we get ready to close, I want to make sure people understand um, how much material you put out in your show. And that was the idea of how long, you know, these USOs have been being reported from Navy ships. And uh, I think one of them dates back to, what, 1945. And I was trying to remember uh, the Delroth. That was a, a, a transport ship. You know, when yeah. they saw something that looked similar to a Tic Tacs syndicate, uh, you know, long maybe. Object. Yeah, yeah, the USS Delroth encounter off the coast of Alaska. I can't remember what the base is there. It's um, ADAT, ADAT yeah. Island. Yeah, Attic Island. Um, and, you know, you can go back even earlier than that. Richard Dolan touched on like, naturalists right if you think about the navies of the world they were the first explorers to go boldly where no man had gone before to find new continents new countries to declare and so on and so forth so they were like our astronauts of the time of of ancient era compared to now and um so they would have highly qualified observers on board of their ships, scientists called naturalists then, that were cataloging and observing everything going on in the atmosphere and the oceans and on land, looking for new species, you know, Darwin, or uh, if you watch the film with uh, Kurt Russell, um, Master and Commander, you know, that's like the perfect example of, of that uh, dynamic going on <laughs> Our oceans with early Navy men. And um, this one case that we talk about in the documentary, Richard Dolan explains this naturalist, British naturalist from 1825, Andrew Bloxham, that wrote about their trip going from uh, the UK, from Britain, all the way down to Hawaii. And when they were in this area of the Pacific, they witnessed a large glowing spear like object that came out of the ocean it was so bright it you know completely illuminated the deck of the ship and all the navy personnel that were seeing this um were pretty shocked it went back into the ocean and it came out again at a different time um and you know this is kind of similar to 
what we see with the phenomenon nowadays coming out of the ocean. Sometimes it's like these sphere type objects. So, um, yeah, there's like paleo contact incidents. There's uh, these ancient incidents with our olden navies and our recent navies. So um, it's all connected, in my opinion. I think there's something that's been here for a lot longer than uh, we really pay respect to in history. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I think what that does is it pretty much you know, puts to bed the idea that all of this, everything we've seen is either misidentification or it's some secret black project because this stuff has been around, like I said earlier, you saw the triangles in the 50s. You can go back further than that. But I mean, you're talking 1800s. I think if you went back, you could probably go a lot further back than that. And so, you know, I think it's like I said, it's probably one aspect of the phenomenon as well. Well, do any of you guys have anything else to add? I thought we've had a, just a wonderful conversation. I, I just I want to say this before you speak, though. Um, the reason I do what I do is because I'm trying to do what, you know, what your same goal is to get this out to the public. And so uh, one of the things I want to thank you guys for coming on is because you helped me do that. You know, having Steve Bassett and Mario Woods and Matt Laszlo and, and Margie Kay and then different individuals come on, you really helped me to be able to, to do that, I, I put out a, a tweet, you know, about a, you know, try to tell everybody, don't get political on this. But the first uh, President Bush talked about the thousand points of light. And I think that's how we should see ourselves as one of those thousand points of light, trying to get this message out to make it normal for the rest of the people. Now, I'll give you a chance if you want to say anything else, um, anything else you want to bring up about your show or future projects or anything like that. And uh, just remind everyone that the link to the white papers and to also to your movie on um, Prime and on Apple TV, I've got the links right there in the chat as well. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'll quickly touch. I know I've been talking up a storm, but um, I'll just say this, that, uh, you know, the UFO and UAP community is great. It, it allows for a synthesis of ideas where people can constructively talk about this subject and try to ferret out or understand what's really going on in our reality. But, um, you know, the infighting and the uh, disrespectful argument towards each other and defamation is not worth it. Um, it's not worth engaging with. It's better to just have constructive, conver constructive conversations. I mean, I've interacted with some great guys and gals on UFO Twitter that, you know, we've taken turns reading research papers and uh, talking about theories and, you know, each reading a paragraph. And that's like super cool. I think that's like almost like family style um, research uh, of this phenomenon um, online, you know, and, um, when it, when it becomes like this personal attack and vendetta sort of thing, people have to remember we're going into an election year. We're in election year, my bad. Um, and things are starting to get more and more politically charged and people sometimes dig their heels in and say, you know, I'm staunchly with this party and back everything that they say and do. And others do the same thing. And this phenomenon, this subject does not have to be tainted by that. Exactly. People, people can get along regardless of their political views. We need to not dig our heels in. And I'm Canadian. People are going to call me a grifter or some negative thing for every positive comment you have, you got probably about 10 or 20 negative ones, which can all go right in the friggin' rubbish bin, in my yeah. opinion, because sure. actions speak louder than words. People got to start treating each other with respect, regardless of what party they uh, believe they come from or back and just, you know, treat each other like family. Check. 
check your politics at the door. That's what I've been saying from day one. I said it yesterday. I said it again today because it is eating up UAP Twitter. Tweet, treat people the way you want to be treated. And, I, you know, I've got a policy. If, if, if trolls attack me, if trolls come on being negative, I just block them. I take them out of my world, out of my universe. You know, <laughs> that's what I do. Yeah. So, Andy, what would what would be one of the last things that you want the audience to know about you and about kind of where you're going and what your goals are real quick? I want to make sure to give you some time as well. Uh, no, I, honestly, I, I'd like to touch up with the, what Darcy was saying and you just mentioned as well is, you know, when we like we're, we're all we're all fighting for the same goal. You know, we're trying to get the same truth. And when we, you know, when the community gets like that and is divided in that manner and, you know, they fight with each other or, uh, you know, one person trying to get more attention than the other, this is what, this is what they want. They want us to, they, they want to maintain us in that, in that position because when you're not unified, there's no power, mm -hmm. you know, and as long as it stays that way, you know, we just we just doing what they want. We're 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 maintain we're we're being kept in the same position that they want us to stay in. But if we came together and actually worked together, forget it. You could could you just imagine what we'd be able to accomplish if we just did that? I mean, it, it's there's power there there is power in unity, especially when it comes to this topic and and what we're trying to accomplish with it so I, I think that you know people need to understand that and put their ignorance and all that to the side and and stop giving them what what it is that they want that like like stop feeding into that and do this the right way so that way we can we can accomplish what it is that we're trying to accomplish yeah and i i really do suspect this this isn't a conspiracy theory but i i absolutely believe that there are some people that are going to the social media outlets purposely um maybe even orchestrated by some in the government to try to cause division because like you said andy together i mean i don't think they can stop us i mean if we no, are we united do. and we have you know we keep our faith we believe that if we just keep fighting a good fight that we're going to get there and so i, I appreciate um both of you appreciate uh, your viewpoints i absolutely agreed with them and uh, the insight that that you guys brought was just phenomenal now unfortunately we lost my partner rob he was having some connectivity issues but i really appreciate rob as well and i'm so grateful that he was here and so once again thank you guys for being on the show i want to let you know how much i appreciate it and someday we'll have to have you back on again okay I appreciate thanks you. Thank you. really appreciate having us on and sorry with the first postponement that we had to go through uh you know what it was worth the wait Amen. Thank you. It's absolutely worth the wait. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.